how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. I'm gonna answer questions from last week's videos. Uh, we're doing this as a family today, so this looks a little bit different than our normal recap video setup. So I've got my computer here in my lap and I hope it all goes well here. My arm is probably gonna get tired. Aaron, I should have like thought about a tripod <laughs> yeah, probably I situation. Tripod if you want. Do, uh, that, might, that might work. Well, let's see how long I last. <laughs> I don't know. I hope you all had a really good holiday weekend. It was really nice for us, super relaxing. The weather was hot, but nice. Not as hot as it normally is, so I'm not gonna complain. First video from last week was a tour of our new high tunnel. So we just showed you the new high tunnel that we put up on the new property, and it's basically a, um, like a scaled down version of our normal, like our regular greenhouse that we have near our barn, um, in that it's not permanent, it's not cemented into the ground so that we can collapse it and move it to its permanent location later on. Because as you know, the whole uh, section we have set up there where we're planting things this year is completely temporary. That's not where it's gonna end up. Um, so it's gonna work out really well. We set it up to house extra plants that we have hanging out here waiting for projects. It's really uh, kind of difficult to take care of them when it gets really hot because they require a lot of water and they can easily scorch. So I think this is gonna be a good solution. First question was from Pepper. So many plants on a large piece of property. What is your end game goal? To open a landscaping business or a garden center? I'm very curious. Um, neither. Our end goal is just to take really good care of the plants that are sent our way. Uh, we make videos about gardening and planting things and so we always like to have a good back stock of plants to use in projects either here or somewhere else. Um, so that is the goal is just to take as good a care of our plants as we can next question is from Linda I'm thinking about purchasing one of these high tunnels I could not find a link for the shade cloth where did you buy it it was from the same place wasn't it Aaron growers yeah. friend yep. growers friend it's just an add-on an add-on so it didn't come with the high tunnel just the plastic farmers did. friend right is that what you said I said grower's friend. Yeah, farmer's friend. It's That's farmer's what, friend? Yeah. Dang it. <laughs> Every time. So farmer's friend, we'll link it down below so you guys can check it out. It's a good thing we're not working with that company because they'd be very unhappy with your inability to remember their name. That's right. Probably <laughs> very true. Uh, next question is from Benji Davis. With your new property, will you contemplate building your dream greenhouse? Probably not out on that piece of property. I have a couple other locations in mind. It might require the purchasing of another piece of property. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron laughs, which it, honestly, it's not in the cards for a while. Like we are trying to do as much of this as we can, like without getting ourselves into any kind of hole. Um, so we're just going to be doing projects as we are financially able to do them. Um, and so I don't know, like, I think it would be awesome to have one where the gazebo is right there because we never use that gazebo and it kind of doesn't fit with the aesthetic of our property. Um, I mean, I'm thankful to have it because we do use it on occasion, but just very rarely. Um, I also think there's a, yeah, there's a couple other locations, but I don't know. It's so like pipe dream at this point. I try not to think about it too much. <laughs> does the Legend of the Fall bottle br brush attract bees like other bottle brushes do? Yes, it does. <laughs> Two Acres Evolving says, I need something like this. I tend to buy my plants before I even know where to put them and they sit in their cans for a while. Will you keep this up during the winter as well? Uh, probably so. We'll probably, well, we'll probably winter over things in our regular greenhouse because we've got it completely, like we can have it completely buttoned up, like there will be no cold air that will be allowed to get in because the sides go down and the front and back have been framed in, unlike this one. It'll probably stay up just because we won't want to take it down and we may end up using it, I'm just not sure. Also, when you take one of the plants out, do you just cap off that drip tube until you're ready to use it again? Yes. We intentionally made each one of the runs of drip tubing to each plant long so that we could clip off emitters and add a different size emitter if we needed to or we can add a goof plug which is a cap on the end when we are no longer utilizing that um, specific piece of drip tubing. Your girl from Worcester said no tables in the tunnel. Not in this one because it's used for something completely different. Our regular greenhouse has tables because we've got uh, flats of four inch size plants that I don't really want to have on the ground. With this one, we're doing bigger size stuff, so two gallon and up, um, and things just do better on the ground and you really can't stack. So even if we put it on tables, one, they're really heavy. So we'd have to do some like majorly fortified tables compared to what we build for the four inch plants. Um, and then you can't put anything under them because then water just drips down and it just like creates a kind of a, I don't know, a problem. Plants don't like to be dripped on constantly from above. Alex said, I battle groundhogs and deer. Do you think that I could use this framework in conjunction with hardware cloth to completely enclose my veggie garden and protect it from wildlife? I 
think you absolutely could do that. And Michelle said, may have to get one of these for my new property. Silly question, how do you winter over plants? If I don't get something planted soon, they die even without watering. So the way we winter over plants is we fit as many things as we can into our greenhouse. Again, we will be using the greenhouse that's completely enclosed. Um, and I, I do winter over some evergreens and perennials and things like that, trees, Japanese maples, in containers outside. The ones that are too big for me to move, they stay out. The most important thing is to make sure that you don't let them dry out. Um, and I think that that's like the furthest thing from our mind in the winter time. We think, well, everything's dormant. It doesn't need water. Well, if that root ball dries, then the plant will most likely die. So I usually do a two week alarm on my phone to remind me to go check things for water. So if I just, you don't have to do like a deep watering, but just splash a little water on your containers, either outside or in uh, the greenhouse or wherever, kind of whatever kind of situation where you're wintering them over so that they maintain some kind of moisture, then that usually works out pretty good. You do, whoa, bubble. You do want to keep in mind that if you are wintering over like perennials and things that lose their leaves, most of the time they, it's not important that they have a ton of light because they're not like soaking in the light. And you can put them in a, a unfinished garage or something like that. But if you're wintering over something like an evergreen or something that has leaves on it still, they still need light. So you want to make sure wherever you put them, it's still in a spot where they can receive that. Benjamin, are you blowing bubbles? Are you having a good time? Oh, good job. Okay, Aaron went in to go search for a tripod for me, but I'll try to answer a few more questions while I feel the burn in my arm. Like that's a good thing, right? <laughs> Little workout. Uh, second video was ideas for repurposing tea tins. And we had a super rainy day this last week. Like it poured all day long, which really you have to adjust your, your I don't know, your thought process for the day. Cause all of a sudden it's, kind of hard to film projects outside in the pouring rain. Here's the tri tripod. Oh, yeah. Anyway, it was a super fun project because I just kind of rooted around in my containers and thought, what is something that I could do that's just fun and small? And I forgot I had those tea tins that my sister gave me. So anyway, that's how that video came about. Oh yeah, tripod is gonna be much better. So anyway, with the tea tins, I did one was a fresh cut flower arrangement. One was a just succulent arrangement and one was a mini fairy garden. Uh, so Kelly said the flower vase will need water rewatering very frequently, but they're just adorable. And that's very true with a reservoir that small to hold water. I actually found that the best place to put that was right above our kitchen sink, kind of right in the middle of the window. Um, I see it all the time. And then I also, because I see it all the time, I remember to put water in it all the time. Um, so anyway, like positioning that close to a sink, either in the kitchen or the bathroom, I think it's the best way to go. Uh, Brandy said, somebody help please. I doubt Laura will see this or her hubby, hoping somebody else in the comments can help me. My super tunias in two hanging baskets are starting to have leaves turn yellow. I'm backing off on water in case they were getting too much, but what else could it be or should I do? I fertilize with miracle Grow once uh, a week to every 10 days. Do you think I need something with higher iron? I've never had this issue before, yes. So uh, we use the Proven Winners Water Soluble Plant Food. It has chelated iron in it, and that's the most important thing for supertunias and superbells to keep them from yellowing. Um, typically like one, yes, you addressed your, it could be a water issue. Um, and if it we're getting too much or if you had a little bit too much rain, it could be that they just like, you know, backing off is a good idea and it might just take them a minute to uh, respond to not getting as much water and green back up. But chelated iron, if the leaves look yellow but they still have dark green veins, that usually means an iron issue. So look at the um, label on your fertilizer. I don't know if miracle Grow has chelated iron in it, but I know I've been using the Proven Winter stuff for years now and I don't typically have issues with that except for on Super Bells occasionally, um, in which case you can use like an iron. I'm gonna do, I've got some Super Bells showing it and I'm gonna do um, a high iron treatment to them um, in addition to the water soluble fertilizer that has chelated iron in it. Creative Queen Bee said that those succulents have roots. No, they didn't. And it would be incredibly hard to fit rooted succulents in a plant can that small. When you're using cuttings, it's easy to just kind of jam everything in there. And the beauty of using cuttings too in, in situations like that where you don't want them to, like they're so packed in there, you wouldn't want them to start growing right away, is that they'll sit there for a couple of months just thinking about starting to form roots. 
then they'll start to form roots and it'll take them a while to start wanting to think about growing because they are restricted in the amount of room that we've given them to grow. Um, so you get so much longer out of an arrangement like that when you do use cuttings. Uh, Tamara said, I tagged you on Twitter a couple, a few, okay, lots of times with Chip Gaines, which is so sweet, because I think you should be part of their new Magnolia network. I'm curious though, is that something you would want to pursue to have a show like Peon Smith? I don't want uh, to get you into something you don't want. We just love watching you. And that is so sweet, Tamara, for you even thinking to do that. Um, you know, we've been approached by several of the larger networks about doing a TV show, and we have declined up to this point because right now, look, we're so happy with how things are going, and we're happy with life. We're happy that we get to stay home, um, and that's big for me. I'm such a homebody. I'm not a huge one to want to go travel a lot. We used to travel a lot more. Um, and I don't know if I just kind of like got it out of my system or, or whatever. I think there'll be a day to when Benjamin's a little bit older where we'll want to travel again. And so he can see things. Um, but I don't want a job that takes me away from home, um, because I want to be here. And I also like that we can completely control, uh, our content. We don't have anybody ever telling us what to do at any point. Um, so what we show you in our garden is truly things that we're doing in our garden at that moment and I think it's so much more um, authentic and that's how I want to remain so at this point like we're just super happy with life and how things are going that's so sweet of you uh, Lisa said do you ever use the color chart when choosing colors for containers or arrangements or do you just choose what you like and what you think looks good together the latter. I just choose what I like and what I think will go together. Sometimes it works awesome. There was a big spider on me. Ugh. Yeah, sometimes I really like how things come together and sometimes I feel like they could use a little bit of work, but it's all about practice and every once in a while you nail it and you feel really good about those times and every once in a while you think, well, that was a good learning experience. That's just how I roll. Depressed and wondering said, my favorite part was when the fairy's head popped off. So, <laughs> the whole entire project was a complete calamity. Like every single one of those arrangements gave me a huge fit. Like the succulent one I think was first. Did I do that one first? All the succulents, like there was one that would not stay where I wanted it to be. Like the the um, stem needed to be a half inch longer for it to anchor properly and things just kept popping out. And I, it's been so long since I've done something so kind of little and fiddly um, that I just kind of felt like I had lost my finesse, like I need to practice on that a little bit more. And then the fresh cut flower arrangement was next and I filled it up with water, started arranging. Things weren't sitting exactly where I wanted to be. So I pulled everything out. Thank goodness that happened because then it started to leak water everywhere and I realized that the container was not watertight so then I had to address that problem. Then the fairy garden. I'm putting the fairy in the fairy garden and I just, the head popped right off of the fairy. <laughs> I, I wasn't even manhandling it. I don't know how that happened, but it did. And I had to hot glue it just right there on the spot. And eventually we got them all to work out and they looked good, <laughs> I think in the end. But boy, that was a trial. All right, so next video was visiting a local lavender farm and making lavender wreaths with my mom. And you guys seem to love that video. And it was just like a kind of a breath of fresh air for me. It was just a really relaxing day where I didn't feel in a rush or push to get anything done. Um, I didn't have any extra projects just kind of weighing on me at home. So I was able to completely um, kind of release. And I felt, feel like my mom was in the same position. It's, we're kind of getting to that time of year where things just aren't pressing as, as much. I mean, we have lots of things we would like to do, but it's not stuff like we got to get these things in the ground right now or, you know, that sort of thing. So it was just su a, such a fun day. We went to a local lavender farm, um, toured around her little garden and um, uh, harvested some lavender and then brought it back here and made some lavender wreaths. Christy said, do you happen to know what variety of lavender is? Yes. I think I told everybody that it was Grosso Blue, which I was close, but that's not quite what it was. It is Gross Blue, so G-R-O-S, separate word, B-L-E-U. That was the variety that we cut. And we got that whole big massive amount of lavender off of I think just six plants. I'll have to go back and count, but it was like six, maybe seven plants. It was a tremendous amount of lavender. Uh, Tracy said, you are so sweet to appreciate others' gardens where yours is so amazing. That's really a sweet comment. Also, if we want the look of a fancy ribbon, but not the expense of it, what would you suggest as a budget-friendly alternative? Um, you know, fabric works really well. If you can find a beautiful fabric and get a yard of that, um, you can always like cut strips of that. And you want to make sure if it's a type of fabric that frays to put a little bit of that fray it's like a fray stop. I don't know what it's called exactly. It comes in this like little squeeze bottle that you can kind of run along the edge of ribbons to help stop the fraying. It's like kind of a glue 
I don't know. But that is a more pro probably inexpensive option. That ribbon, that's the first time I've ever seen that brand of ribbon at our local Joann's. And I was kind of like, I mean, it was like $45 for six feet. Six feet, two yards of ribbon, which barely made a bow. My mom made it really pretty. I mean, to work with just that amount of ribbon to make it look like she, how she did. Um, but it was, it was on sale that day, only 25% off. So it's still really expensive, but I've never really seen ribbon that's that beautiful though. All the other stuff, like you can find some ribbons that are pretty, but not like that. Like these were like tapestries. They were amazing. Every once in a while you got a spring for the for something like that. I didn't, as you can see. I was just sitting sitting there thinking like, I don't typically put a lot of bows on my wreaths and um, I wanted mine for my tool shed so I wanted kind of the simplistic look and I just could not conjure up a reason to buy one of those rolls of ribbon. I just thought, I don't even know where I would use it. Like I would buy it just to have it because it's pretty, but do I really want to spend that money? <laughs> I could buy plants. <laughs> Uh, Stacy said, love all the lavender and the vibrant color. What type was it? The gross blue. Will the wreath last beyond this year? It depends on how you're keeping them and how you are storing them. If you have it hung somewhere inside, which my mom has a lavender wreath from last spring or last summer rather, hanging on her door, her interior door at work in her office and it's still there looking really good. Occasionally somebody will brush past it and knock a little bit of it off because it does dry and it gets brittle. Um, if you've got it somewhere where it's just kind of left alone and undisturbed, I mean, it will last indefinitely until you, you think it gets too dusty, really. I think that's what would be the demise in the end is it looking kind of dusty and dirty. Um, outside, I'm gonna get this season out of mine and then I'll just make a new one next year. Cassie said, it's always lovely to see you and your mom. My own mother and I are very close as well. Have you two always been close? We have been. I mean, I think that there's there's those teenage years. There's those couple of years where a lot of kids want to kind of push away from their parents and they gravitate a little bit more toward friends. And I did that. I mean, I think that's a typical, normal teenager thing to do. But my parents were incredibly good at making life fun. What's up, buddy? Oh, I will in just a minute, babe. I'm answering some questions. You want to come help me? I'm going to go move to the gazebo. Benjamin wants me to come in there. Anyway, I was saying that my parents were always really good at making life fun and making life special and making us always feel like, I don't know, we were doing a good job at whatever we were doing. And they have maintained that through our adult years to where like we all wanna hang out and we all, I don't know, we hang out with my parents all the time and with Aaron's parents. They both did a really good job. What you doing? I'm playing house. Are you playing? We're playing basketball. Oh, nice. Oh, oh. All right, I'm in the gazebo now. And the second I set up, Benjamin wants to go out into the yard and play croquet. Oh well, okay, moving on. Uh, the rest of that question was, did you study agriculture, horticulture, or landscaping in college? No, I did not. I went to college to become a nurse. And uh, I think you quickly find out when you start doing your clinicals, you quickly figure out if you're cut out for that kind of job or not. And I think that you need to be, like nurses are special, special people. And I think you really need to be called to be in that, uh, that sort of position, and I was not. I learned most of what I know uh, from growing up in the garden, growing up at the garden center, always helping my parents in the garden, and then having my own garden. I mean, honestly, I've probably learned the most um, by having my own garden and trying things, failing at them, having some successes as well. Also working at the garden center. I mean, I was telling, talking to Erin the other day about how much I learned just watering plants because I didn't just water plants, I read plant tags. And when you have to water for upwards of four hours a day, because in the hot part of the summer, you're watering first thing in the morning and then you turn around and do a lot of watering a second time in the day to keep things happy. And so I was reading tags constantly and you learn so much by reading plant tags. I did anyway. I'm like learning botanical names and things like that. Like seeing those things repetitively really helped me out. Rosemary said, what a wonderfully calming and nurturing video. Thank you so much. How much would enough lavender to make a big wreath like that cost and what kind of lavender was it? Um, so as, in terms of cost, for my size of wreath, for all the supplies, it would be probably between 40 and $50. My mom's wreath, I'm not including the cost of ribbon because that was kind of a, um, a splurge um, just for that amount of lavender now she used a lot more lavender than I did and I think hers would be about between 50 and 60 so it is fun to go out and actually harvest some lavender in a setting like that but you could also grow your own I mean what a fun thing to be able to go out and it needs to be cut back in the middle of the summer anyway in order to bloom the second time so you could cut it back and then make some wonderful things out of it 
And then Queen Bee said, how did you get rid of the stem tail on the last bundle that you placed on the frame since you're not wiring over it with new bundles? You tuck it in. Um, and that's one thing, I think we've showed it in previous like holiday wreath, um, like Christmas greens kind of thing wreath. Um, I showed more of a close up of tucking. You tuck in the tail, you don't leave the tail really long like my mom did. She intentionally left the tail on, on hers just to show a different, more unique way of making a wreath. I did mine just very simple and classic. Um, but you take the last bundle and you just lift that first bundle up slightly and tuck it under. And then while you're still holding the other bundle kind of up, you wire around that last bundle. So it's kind of hidden underneath that first one, if that makes sense. And then a lot of times in the end, if you don't get it quite as full right there, you can um, end your wreath by cutting the wire and then lashing it to the back. And then you can create, create little individual bundles that you can then wire in into the sparse areas. Next video was harvesting garlic and planting sweet potatoes. So I had 115 heads of garlic in two three by four raised beds out of the garden. They were wonderful. I was a little bit late in harvesting them. So I lost, I didn't lose any, but I lost the papery skin around some of them because they just were in the ground too long. It had deteriorated, which is not a big deal. We'll just utilize those heads of garlic first. Um, and then when I was all done with that, I planted sweet potato slips, which are really late to be planting those, but I think we'll be okay. I think we've got enough time to get a little bit of action out of those. Uh, Gemma said, is it important to dry the garlic in the shade? I like to dry mine in the shade. I know a lot of people, they harvest it right where, like they harvest it and leave it right where they've harvested it, just right, right on top of the soil. It'll dry out a lot faster, so you wanna keep that in mind so that you can move it to a place to cure, probably in 24 hours, I would imagine, if it's in the sun. Um, it gets pretty hot here and pretty uh, unrelenting, like there's no cloud cover and things like that. Um, so I like to just move it to a bright shaded spot where I know it's got a little bit more protection. And then the dry out process maybe takes a day or two longer. Edna said, how do you get such bright, beautiful, perfect green leaves on your vegetable garden, in your vegetable garden? Uh, I think soil quality. Soil quality has so much to do with the success of your crops. Also, consistent water, and we have had a very favorable spring and early summer uh, weather-wise. So I think all of those things combined have created a really lush, beautiful garden space. But I have really paid attention to the soil. Like I did a layer of leaf mulch last year, sprinkled it with blood meal, which is kind of an activator to kind of almost like have your own little compost layer going right on top of the raised beds. Then we worked that into the soil this spring along with land and sea compost and biotone starter fertilizer. And then every time I plant something new, I add in more biotone starter fertilizer. Sometimes I add in more compost like I did in this video. And I think just constantly adding good nutrients back into the soil just makes your plants perform so much better. Alex said, I live in Alaska. Would garlic be okay during the winter when the ground is frozen? It is here. I mean, like three years ago, we had negative 17 degree temps. I had garlic in the ground and it did great. Um, so I don't know, depending on your area of Alaska, if it gets like really cold. I mean, I don't have any experience with that, but I have had it do really well in ours um, where it's gotten down as low as negative 17. So kind of I don't know, I would check with your local garden center or people gardening, people that you know up there that may have uh, experienced what garlic is like in your area. Uh, Gerlene said, can I use grass clippings instead of leaves? I don't have access to enough leaves. So I think the thing to be cognizant about with using grass clippings is that there's a difference. So you're usually in compost looking for a green source and a brown source. So a nitrogen source is your green source um, and your brown source is your carbon source. And you need a mix of those in order to create a really healthy compost pile that breaks down. If you have too much one or the other, it doesn't blend, it doesn't break down as quickly. So your grass clippings when they're green are a source of nitrogen. And if you get too many of those, too much of those, I don't think it's necessarily a great thing. Um, so you would want to make sure that they have dried out a little bit maybe so if you can spread them out somewhere I mean, you know, they may have a chance if you do it in the fall when they're not you're not growing anything And they have a chance to kind of dry out and decompose a little bit then you would be okay um, But I think the leaves just work so well uh, Because they break down so much quicker. I think worth a shot I mean, maybe just don't do quite as thick of a layer Ken said seeing the homes being built behind you I have to ask over the years has Boise been encroaching on your small town and rural area I live in Southern California and have known several people who have moved up to the Boise area three of which in just the last month that are all from the same Trader Joe's market. Uh, the Boise area has ex experienced tremendous amount of growth, like a crazy 
crazy amount of growth. Uh, our immediate area, we're 67 miles away from Boise, so about an hour. We haven't grown much, we haven't seen much growth. We are in Oregon, so we, are, we live in Oregon. We are right on the border of Oregon and Idaho. In fact, like, um, I could probably, from certain areas of our yard, I could see Idaho, because <laughs> we're right on the river. Uh, like our house isn't, but like we are on a hill and then it kind of goes down, uh, the land goes flat for a little bit. Then you can see the river and right on the other side of it, there's um, Idaho. And we really should be lumped in with Idaho, honestly, because we, we don't get Oregon papers, we don't get Oregon broadcasting, it's all Idaho. Uh, and it, it's interesting. I mean, I'm thankful we do live in a very small town, very rural, um, and I appreciate that for a lot of different reasons. So I'm glad that our area hasn't really experienced a ton of growth. Um, and it's fun to see Boise expanding and growing. Um, and you do get to meet some really neat people. Like I just met some people who moved up um, to Star, which is an area or town between here and, and Boise. Um, and they were from California and they seem like really interesting people. Um, so anyway, yeah, that area is growing. Boise is an awesome city. I really like it. It just feels good. It doesn't feel like you're in a big, massive city. And I like that. I don't, not a huge, I don't know. I think it's just growing up in a small town. That's kind of what I like. Uh, Gil said, thanks for the great video. This one had me wondering, do you worry about rotating crops in your beds from year to year? Or perhaps it doesn't matter too much since you're adding in so much before planting. Um, you know, I do think it makes a big difference when you're constantly adding things into the soil because that's kind of one of the issues is disease or things that um, can potentially, like after you plant so many years in a row, the same thing, you can deal with some issues disease wise. Um, but also there are certain crops that take a tremendous amount of nutrients out of the soil. And if you don't replenish it and you plant the same thing in that area, like alliums, like garlic, I plant those in a different area every year and onions as well, because they take so much. If I was to plant all alliums back in that soil without a mending it, then they wouldn't have as much to feed on and I would have more of a meager crop, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't really focus on it too much. Like I never like really think about it. I just, I mean, I do, I think, where did I plant garlic last year? I'll make sure to plant it in a different bed. It's not a big deal. I just kind of like move things around a little bit. It kind of makes it more interesting and fun aesthetically to do that anyway. Next video is planter update and maintenance. Uh, what did I do in that video? Oh yeah, the four tan large containers along our east fence line. Uh, the geraniums and the grasses in the center were kind of getting gobbled up by the super tunias, so I went along and did just a little bit of trimming, uh, and they look a lot better. Like you can see the grasses now and the geraniums, I think will have more airflow, so they'll start performing a little bit better. But those pots have been just amazing this year. I absolutely love the plants that are in there. Denise said, do you trim petunias in flower beds as well or just those planted in pots? I am not sure that I've ever trimmed a petunia that's in the ground. Unless it starts encroaching on a sidewalk or like into a grassy area, I might trim it a little bit so that I'm the one doing it and not the lawnmower, which can do a much like more sloppy job, I guess. <laughs> and when the trimmer comes along and like just trims them flat, it looks a little bit better to uh, hand prune those sorts of things. But I've never really noticed any legginess or anything like that when they're in the landscape. Crystal said, do you water them every day? Yes, those are on drip and they run every single morning. DJ said, how do you pick the variety of Felco pruners? There are so many variables. The website is not too helpful in description. Um, you know, there are on the packaging, they, it tells you like how big of a branch diameter they can cut. It tells you if they're righties or lefties, if they're for small, medium or large hands, there's like a little, um, little pictures for all of that, which is very helpful, but it's very easy to open up all those packages. If you can go to your local garden center somewhere that carries them, um, which hopefully you can find somewhere that carries them, you can feel them in your hands before you actually make the purchase. We will probably be doing, you know, we were working with Felco now, um, which is so exciting because I've been using their pruners for as long as I can remember. My parents have been as well. Um, and so we'll probably do a video at some point kind of explaining some of those differences um, and what might be helpful to you know, you based on what kind of jobs you're doing and what size of hands you have and all that sort of thing. Felco 2s have been my number one forever. Um, and I really, really, really like them. I like how they fit my hands. They don't make me feel tired, like my wrist never hurts. And I've tried out a lot of different pruners, a lot of well-known brands too. And they just don't hold a candle to how Felcos have felt. Anyway, 
We'll probably be doing more giveaways along the way too, so be watching for that. Uh, next question, so when's the summer garden tour? We're hoping maybe this week to film one. I don't know, last week kind of got away from us. We were hoping to do it last week and it just didn't happen. Um, so yeah, maybe this week. It's supposed to be pretty hot though. It's supposed to get close to 100 degrees. Um, so maybe one of these mornings and the early wee hours of the morning, we can go out and film a quick tour. A lot of pretty things to see right now. Agatiz says, shouldn't you paint the containers terracotta? No, those containers I picked out on purpose. I picked out the shade of them, the style of them, and I love them. They're the Jumbo, is it Jumbo Garden Jardinier from Unique Stone. We'll put the name on the screen because I can't quite remember. Um, I love the fact, because there are so many of them along that fence line, I didn't want them to be too busy. Um, and I tend to like like kind of ornate things, but I think if I would have done ornate looking containers, it would have been too much. They just needed to be lightly detailed. Um, I like natural colored concrete for several reasons. I think it's an understated beauty. Um, it kind of uh, almost not melts into the background still stands out you still notice it but it doesn't scream for attention like other colors do and we deal with hard water in our area and while I do like some other stain colors it's incredibly hard to deal with our hard water staining on darker colors um, because it, yeah it just is it they it kind of like just blends into the natural color concrete you know you get kind of this white hard water patina and you just don't notice it as much I do like terracotta containers though like I'm looking around in here I've got some Japanese maples in terracotta containers just right next to me I'm not sure that I would like that many terracotta containers in that large of a size though, in an area. I don't know, maybe. And Nancy said, over here in the Willamette Valley, I'm getting a bunch of budworm damage on my petunias. You said you use BT weekly. So BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. You may also see it called thuricide on a container. It's a natural bacteria found in the soil that only, uh, only kills caterpillars. They have to ingest it in order for it to take care of them. It doesn't hurt honeybees or any of your other things flying around, which is awesome. Um, but it takes care of the budworms that eat all of the buds off of your supertunias and superbells. That wasn't the question, but tangent. We start spraying the first week of May and we do it once a week. And we've been having really good luck with that schedule this year. Would it be possible for you to show us how you treat the petunias, the actual spraying or treating? I'm a visual learner and just like reading instructions. And I am with you, Nancy. I'm so the same way. We have done a video in the past and I asked Aaron, did we actually show the spraying? And he said we did. So I will see if he will link that video down below um, and then maybe check that out. And really, I mean, you mix up the BT or thuricide in the pump sprayer and you just thoroughly wet down your plants. So I wet it down on the top and then I stick the wand into the plant and I try to like lift it up. So wait, first I do the underside when it's not all wet. So I lift up the whole canopy of the plant and spray underneath. Then I lay it back down, spray the top, and then I stick the wand into the plant. So there's like the three prong coverage approach and it usually does pretty good. And the very last video from this week was planting maple trees on the new property. And I kind of feel like Aaron needs to be here because he kind of did that video. I helped like a tiny little bit, but he planted all four of those red point maple trees. They were in huge containers. Um, and they were just like, I can't manhandle the, that big of a tree. Like even in my younger days, <laughs> I couldn't really, I mean, it was hard to manhandle. It's they're so heavy. Um, so I was thankful that he just kind of took on that project himself to get it done. And it was also very hot. Um, so huge props to Aaron for doing it. Uh, first thing was Tyler, every other YouTube channel, drama, garden answer, trees. Yes, more trees and less drama in this world would make this world a much better place. Uh, Neil said, I don't think Aaron put any iron or biotone in the last two trees. Saw that comment a lot. And I always tell Aaron, you can't cut that kind of stuff out when you edit. And he's like, oh no, people will just assume that I used it. Like, you don't show it. It didn't happen, um, but he did. He did it, add in the iron tone and the biotone. It just got cut in the editing process. Anne said, does the maple have a prolific surface root system? We were discouraged from using maples because of that, but I sure like their color. Uh, you know, this particular maple, we've never had an issue with. In fact, here in our area, and I don't know if it's like a uh, environment or our soil type, but we've never had surface roots issues with maple trees. I mean, I've got, maple trees all over this property and I did in our last garden too. My parents do in their garden. Um, I see them, they're used all the time around sidewalks like on our um, street areas and we've never had issues with them buckling sidewalks or making an issue in our grass. Um, so yeah, it might have to do, I'm trying to think if there's a specific 
variety of maple or type of maple that does that and I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but even though we have hard pan layers, they seem to make it through um, eventually and I was surprised, especially at our old house because we had such, it was so wet, like the water table was so high and that soil was so swampy for the longest time and I really worked on the soil when we were down there, um, but it takes a long time to really improve soil structure. And I, I really did, I think, quite a bit of, of improving while we were there. But the maple trees, like I thought for sure, I'm gonna plant this tree and it's gonna reach a certain level and then it's just gonna get sick and it's gonna look like it's waterlogged. But they didn't. I mean, those maple trees grew so fast. I was so, so surprised. And we were down there all the time because we used to live next door to my in-laws, Aaron's parents. We were right next door neighbors with them for eight years. And um, so we get to see the trees all the time and they're still amazing. No surface root issues that I've noticed. Uh, John said, good job, Erin. You need to get an attachment for your John Deere to make those holes. I've been seeing him watch videos on that specific attachment. So maybe one of these days he'll get one. It would be a huge help to have one, honestly, with this new property because these four trees, this is just the beginning, <laughs> just the beginning of trees on this new property. Uh, Cracked Up Crew said, hey guys, are you not worried as the trees grow and the roots get bigger and the travel uh, and travel that will affect the fence. I love the progress with the new land. That was another really popular question or comment was that we planted them way too close to the fence and we did not. Um, they will be completely fine next to the fence. I mean, never say never um, because you never know what's gonna happen, but seeing the growth rate of these trees in several different locations and how they look at almost maturity or at maturity, um, I don't think we'll have any sort of an issue either with the road being there or them being near the fence. I think they'll be completely fine. It's not like you're putting in an oak tree that wants to get 100 feet tall and like these big massive trunks, this tree just doesn't do that. So you do need to be cognizant for sure of what variety you're putting in um, and how they grow in your area. And I think that we just have confidence in this tree because we have grown it so much and have seen how it grows here. Bailey said, this new space sure looks like the perfect spot for a Hartley Botanic greenhouse, maybe in the 10 year plan. 10 year plan sounds about what it's gonna be. Um, and boy, I saw a lot of comments about Hartley Botanics this week. It must've been on your guys' minds. Um, I think about it, you know, every once in a while and how it would be like beautiful to have one right here. Like we could use it still as entertaining. Like I honestly don't know how much I would actually use it for growing. Like I would have plants in it, of course. Um, but would I use it for like seed starting and stuff like that? I don't know. Like I would want it to be set up in a very beautiful, almost like home sort of setting where we've got a dining table and chairs where you could go in and I don't know, just have it be kind of like a second extension of the home where you've got beautiful light and, and all of that. I don't know. It's fun to dream about. So fun. And it's definitely far out there. We have so much to do on this new property. It's going to take us forever. In my mind, it's gonna take us forever. Aaron is the one that moves us forward on projects fast. Like he would have this whole thing, uh, I, I don't know. He would like have it done by the end of this year. <laughs> and I'm the kind of person who's like, you gotta just slow down. Like we gotta enjoy this process. And I don't wanna make decisions so fast that I make the wrong decision, if you know what I mean. Like tree placement, for example. Tree placement is so key because you don't want to plant big trees where you're going to eventually want something else. So you want to be very careful about where you plant them and be very calculated in your decisions. And I think Aaron would just plant them all and then move stuff if it was in his way later. That's kind of how he rolls. Um, and Mel Dog said, why do people question your gardening skills? Like you haven't proven you know what you're doing by now. I come here to learn not to find something Laura's doing wrong so I can teach her something. Mel Dog, I do appreciate that comment. That's very sweet. Um, it is kind of crazy. Uh, the gardening realm, there are so many different opinions. I learned that growing up at the garden center, you'd have somebody come in and you would try to, they'd ask you a question and you would answer it. And then they would follow up with something like, well, I'm a master gardener, so this is how I do it. This is proper. And we always kind of were like, I mean, that's just one example. Um, but I think everybody just has such a different experience and everybody has such a different environment, different soil structure, different set of circumstances that makes their experience different. And while I might have success doing something one way, um, you may have tried it that way and didn't have success with it that way. Um, so it's just really interesting. I do learn a lot. Like there are some things that I do differently now than I did when we very first started this YouTube channel um, because like, 
talking to people in the growing industry, learning more about other people's gardens that are not just in my immediate area have been, it's been such an eye-opening experience for me. And so I try to keep my mind as open as possible. I totally know where those people are coming from when they see something and they're just like, oh, I don't know if that's gonna work. Well, maybe it didn't for them at one point. Um, so anyway, I think most of it's well-meaning, <laughs> but I do appreciate that comment. Abigail says, good work. Two questions I have. Whenever I've planted trees, I've been advised to dig the hole three times wider than the root ball. I assume this is to make sure the soil is loose enough for the roots to spread. Do you find this unnecessary? So typically I like to plant mine like two, or I dig mine rather, um, two times the width of the root ball. Um, three times, I mean, if you wanna take the time to dig a hole that big, awesome, go for it. I did feel like these holes should have been dug a little bit wider. That's just how I would have done it personally. I do feel, however, that plants and trees are incredibly resilient and we've had pretty good luck over the years and we're pretty attentive to our plants. Um, so they get proper water and proper fertilizer. I think that goes a really long way as well. Um, I did mention it to Aaron in the beginning. I was like, ah, I don't know. I think I would dig that out further, but I wasn't the one digging the holes. So I was just like, just plant them. They'll be fine. <laughs> But I did tell him he was gonna get called out for that. And you weren't the only one who asked that question. There were quite a number of you. Uh, second question was, do these maple throw helicopter seeds? No, I've never noticed the red points doing that. I can't find anything. Like I went to their website. It was an introduction maple from J.F. Schmidt um, Tree Company, which is my parents have been getting trees from them for ages. Uh, and so they introduced this tree variety and I can't find anywhere where it says it's seedless, but I've never had any of my red point maples in all the years I've been growing them throw helicopters ever. Um, so, I mean, I can't say with 100% certainty that they never would, but since I've never experienced that, like I use those trees freely around our property just because they're not a big mess. They're just such an amazing tree. I do have a silver maple that throws helicopters 365 days a year, like it's got helicopters on it. And the tree is so glorious, it's by our back sun porch. Uh, in fact, I think I have a picture when it's in fall color, I will try to find it. It's the most beautiful thing. And so sometimes you'll put up with those just be for the beauty of the tree and the shade it provides, it gives a lot back for what you have to deal with. There's just always a constant like mulch layer of helicopters down below. Um, and the last question for this week was from Immortal Oreo. Aren't you supposed to loosen the root ball for the tree to get established faster and better? The roots of the trees look a little pot bound, so I was just wondering. Um, so the thing about that, those trees, I did score the root ball. Um, so you might have noticed I took my, fel oh, I just kicked the camera, sorry. Um, you might have noticed I took my felcos and kind of like cut down the root ball, and I'll score them like every six inches if I feel like there's a spot that's a little bit more pot bound. So I did that on these. Aaron didn't do it on the first one he had already planted, so when he pulled it up out of the hole to replant it, I went in and I did score that root ball. So all of them had been scored. They weren't severely root bound. I know it kind of looked that way, but it, they were pretty loose. And we have learned over the years that unless something is like really root bound, like all you're seeing is roots and you can't fluff them out at all and there's no soil even visible anymore, a lot of times you can do more harm than good and it's not as necessary as I once thought it was. Um, so I don't worry about it a tremendous amount, but I did score those. Uh, so each hole was filled with water, each hole had biotone and iron tone, each root ball was scored. The only difference that I probably would have done is just digging the hole a little bit bigger, but I think they're all gonna be great. So anyway, I think that's it for this video. Uh, now I'm gonna go find Aaron and Benjamin because I think they have abandoned me and they went inside. So hope you guys are all having a great day and I hope you have a great week and we will see you in the next video.